Uh, 30 minutes, you can start. All right. So this, this video or this next 20 minutes is on the history of Indonesia. Um, you can see from the map, this is Australia. This is Darwin right here. It's spread out. It's diverse. As far as some statistics go, it's the fourth most populous na nation on Earth. 250 million. So after China, India and the US, fourth most populous nation. Huge population. It's ethnically diverse. You can see from these different groups, many different groups represented across a vast amount of area. However, religiously, it's not as diverse. It's a Muslim nation. And this is going to have implications later on when we look at the type of democracy it has, when we look at radical Islam. Um, this image captures some of that ethnic diversity. So this captures ethnic groups in Indonesia. And you can see they're clustered. So you can see here there'll be a large group of one type of people. Here there's a large group of a different type of people. Australia is ethnically diverse as well now, but they're integrated, they're spread out throughout. If you pulled up a map of all of the Italian people in Australia, there'd be little specks all over the map. They don't all congregate in an area. Um, it's a little different in Indonesia because they tend because it was formerly a tribal, many tribal nations that have been all brought together under this new nation of Indonesia, they've still got a sense of those ethnic groups. So here you've got the Papuans. And this is um, West Papua. Helps us understand why this group has been able to fight for so long because they're ethnically homogenous. They're all the same. So these are the Papuans, they want independence. They want this section here <coughs> um, to become West Papua instead of Irian Jaya. A short history. So previously, until the present, it's had a, a tribal history. So there are still tribal groups. You can still travel through parts of the Indonesian forest and jungle and find tribal groups who look like your stereotypical image of a tribal person. The Dutch colonized the area. So much like um, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the English, the French, when those empires went on this colonising mission throughout the 15th, 16th, 17th century, or the Dutch who got here first, they colonised. They wanted to use it for trade. And they were very successful at it. They would lose control in 41. Who would they lose control to? The Japanese. The Japanese would end up occupying almost the entire Asia-Pacific region, right up to Australia's doorstep um, in Papua New Guinea. So the Japanese would take control over most of this area. And this would actually work to the favour of those people who wanted an Indonesian state. Because the Dutch were now gone. All these former colonial powers were kicked out when the Japanese took over. So you had this power vacuum left. So once the Japanese lost, they got pushed back gradually by the Americans, the Australians, and other forces. There was a power vacuum left, and it was at this time all over the world that the UN went on this mission to give more and more peoples their independence. And it was because of the Japanese leaving that Indonesians became, well, Indonesia became a state recognised by the UN. So we have our first Indonesian leader, Sukarno. Um, he had fought for many decades for independence from the Dutch. Generally a pretty good guy from the left, communist tendencies. He would end up being replaced by Suharto, a brutal anti-communist dictator who would be supported by Australia, the British um, and the Americans because he was anti-communist. And this is Cold War. And from 1998 onwards, the period we're interested in, we've got this, this democratic project. Elections, elected parliaments, elected officials at local and federal level. Very much a state just like ours, except they would be different to us because they look different, they speak different, they might have different cultural norms than us. But um, politically, a very similar system to ours. Certainly economically more and more similar to ours. So this is a short history. Um, if we start with Sukarno, he was their first president. He led their independence movement, so he fought for that movement for quite some time, and he was imprisoned a few times. He wanted to fuse 
Nationalism, so the idea that they should be a nation. Marxism, so he was from the communist school of political belief. And Islam. He wanted to bring these three things together. And at least two of them hung around for quite some time, the nationalism and the Islam. Uh, the Marxism was shut down pretty harshly by our next leader, Suharto. He was the second president, but he used a coup to take power. So he used his influence in the military. So he got certain, um, he killed the generals who were loyal to the old guy. He ordered troops to take over buildings in Jakarta. And he was supported by the West. And it's easy for us to criticise the West now and say, why would we support a coup? Why would we support a dictator? But it's because he was anti-communist, and this was the heart of the Cold War. And we were supporting anti-communist dictators all over the world. Pinochet in Argentina, um, the generals in Central America. So in the context, we can understand it. It's not forgivable, but we can understand it. So this guy would take power to Hato, anti-communist, he wanted a strong government, centralised, military dominated. So it was all about the generals, all about the military, military being integrated into every level of the country. And this is why for so long, the West hasn't really engaged with Indonesia, hasn't invested in Indonesia. It's been this fear of the military, fear of corruption. It hasn't been like other Western states until very recently. Um, yep, so the anti-communist purges um, killed at least 500,000 people in a short two-year period. So anyone who was rumoured to be a communist, who was a member of a communist party, who had Marxist tendencies, were killed, were wiped out. And this was common across many nations at this time because of the Cold War. Dictators came to power, wanted to brutally suppress their opposition. And once he came to power, um, suppressed any investigation of the events. So this is kind of the context of the period, you know, leading right up until the late 90s. You know, dominated by the military, by suppression, um, by anti-communist sentiment. And this image captures that. That's Suharto. So we, know, we knew the things he was doing. We knew that he was suppressing groups. He was also suppressing um, separatist movements like the West Papuans and the Archonese. And, um, and Reagan, meeting together, having a good time. Why? Because he was anti-communist, he's anti-communist. So we support him because he supports our cause as well. We might not like everything he's doing, but he tends to be on our side politically, so we'll support him. It was uh, an interesting time in the Cold War. But it wouldn't last forever. So he had this strong government, this militarised government. Things would start to go wrong. There was a huge economic downturn, the Asian financial crisis. It affected almost all of Asia. We were actually exempted from it. We got away pretty well because we were starting to mine our resources. But it affected all of Asia really bad. Massive unrest, unemployment, poverty. There's nothing worse for a fragile state than a large number of young men on the streets with nothing to do. Unemployment, very bad. Look at Egypt, look at the Middle East, look at Greece right now. Once you've got large numbers of unemployed, predominantly men, because they're the troublemakers, um, you've got a crisis. And they had huge protests. During one of those protests, four students were shot dead. Um, didn't it? There were over a thousand deaths across the whole um, I think it was four in Jakarta, destruction of buildings. So Jakarta was falling into chaos, the capital. Suharto realised he couldn't maintain, he couldn't keep together all these different disparate groups, the unrest, through you know, brutal suppression. So he stood down. Um, and that's when they would have, Parliament would elect its first leader. Um, in future years, there were um, claims of corruption, his family will end up um, having embezzled billions of dollars from the government, but they would never be charged, interestingly. No one from the Suharto family would be found guilty of any crimes. There was never any um, criminal prosecution. Perhaps because so many people would have been implicated in that corruption. 
So that takes us right up until 1998. We then have a series of elected leaders. Some of them are elected by parliament, the first couple, and then the more recent ones are elected by the people. Um, and this whole period we're going to refer to as the democratic project because it's an ongoing project. You know, they're still finding their feet. You don't need to know these figures' names. Um, I'm just putting them up here and I'm just going to pick out small things. Moderate Islamic, elected by parliament. So parliament chose this guy. Um, he had a lot of support from, support from Islamic groups. But in the end, he, he's actually blind. Um, he wasn't very good at all. He was incompetent. And so the parliament impeached him. So the same parliament that elected him then said, no, he's pretty incompetent. We need to get rid of him and put someone else in place. He only lasted less than a year. We then got Megawati Sukarno Putri, another cool name. And she's really significant in Indonesia. Um, strong, successful female leader. Yes, you can be a strong, successful female leader um, in Asia. Um, she led reforms, massive reforms. She was always calling for these reforms of the political system. Um, she was the daughter of the first president, Sukarno. Um, and it made her look a lot better given that she came in after Wahid, who was corrupt and inept. <laughs> Big pardon? Sukarno. Sukarno is the first one, the good guy. Suharto is the brutal anti communist dictator. And then, again, because her name is Sukarno. So, um, there's a clue there. All right, and then we have our current president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. Now, you'll probably refer to his name once or twice in your essays, so it might be a good idea to try and learn how to spell his name properly, even if it just means you have to write lists and lists of his name until you get it right. I remember it as three syllables. Yud, Y-U-D, Ho, H-O, Yono. That's the way I've learned to spell it correctly. Three syllables, Yud, Ho, Yono. That might be helpful, it might not. You don't need the whole name? No, because you can always just call him President Yadho Yono or Yudhiyono. But when you, when you do a sentence, yes, it's called it. Or can you always just say President? No, you can always just call him the President Yudhiyono. Well, I like saying President Obama or and President Prime Minister Obama. Um, he became significant and noticed because of how well he dealt um, with affairs after the Bali bombings because he was in charge of political and security affairs. He cracked down in a strong way after the Bali bombings. He worked with Australia and the US to form Detachment 88. So he, he had great success in fighting you know, the radical terrorist elements in Indonesia. That brought him to attention. He had a campaign for presidency on these core principles. And it's a great campaign. Prosperity, peace, justice, and democracy. Like, they're those kind of universal words that could mean just about anything. But in the context of Indonesia, you still had a large number of people who were living in poverty. Um, peace can mean many things. Peace with the West, peace with radical groups. Justice, because you've got this long history of corruption and this new democratic project, empowering people with the vote at a local level to elect their local officials, at a federal level to elect the president. So he was elected president. He's known as SBY. He's very often referred to as SBY. <coughs> Even like internationally, political leaders will call him S SBY. Significant enough that Time Magazine called him one of the 100 most important people. And that's predominantly because of this democratic Islamic state and what it represents for the rest of the Islamic world. A chance to democratize and still be successful. And likely enough, you know, political leaders are very often subject to conditions around the state. So he was lucky enough to preside over a period of economic growth. Now, maybe he was responsible for it, maybe he wasn't. Just like right now, um, Australia is in a period of economic decline like most of the world. You could say it's just unlucky that the current government is going to be blamed for a lot of that. So, SBY. Oh, we don't need to know too much. He's been elected twice, he can't be elected again, so this is his last term in office now. Massive support, 61% of the vote, um, winning most provinces. He 
was the first president to be elected in free and fair elections. So the previous two leaders were elected by parliament. He was elected by um, the public. Um, and this is from Simon Crean, who is, um, was a former opposition leader and minister of the Australian government. And he said, now well into his second term, President Udiono is focused on reducing unemployment and alleviating poverty. Sound economic growth underpins his political standing. All Australian leaders speak about this guy glowingly. Diplomatically, he is everywhere. Um, we won't hypothesise while he's closing his eyes. Um, he's also meeting with opposition leaders. Former Prime Minister, a very happy meeting. Obama, Obama's visited twice. And Obama actually lived in Indonesia when he was younger. Uh, this is Hu Jintao, the former president of China. Uh, this is James Cameron, Prime Minister of Britain. David. David. Prime Minister Cameron David. David Cameron. David Cameron. That's a, Cameron. I said Prime Minister Cameron, that was right, wasn't it? Yeah, you said James, James Cameron. James Cameron. He's the director of the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> he met with him the week after. <laughs> and the Russian uh, President um, Putin, um, who is very dodgy indeed. <laughs> I can see him. Buy my tanks. You must buy my tanks. I have KGB. Um, you can see though, it's history, this, this um, image that we've got of Indonesia. Sukarno was a former general. Suharto, former general. Well, he was nobody. Sukarno Putri, the daughter of a general. Yudhiyono, former chief of staff. The military is tied up in their state, linked to their state in a way it's, it's, it's never been linked to ours. And that's necessary to keep all of those different smaller groups together, but it also has been an obstacle to the West being able to embrace it. It's been an obst obstacle to businesses being able to trade <coughs> confidently with Indonesia for fear of corruption. But the major issues that would come out of this long period leading up to the democratic project, and you can see each of these is one of our national interest priorities. So you've got economic disaster in the late 90s. So Indonesia, in the national interest, will have to pursue economic security. We've got issues with the environment, massive deforestation, so they have to pursue environmental security. We've got issues around separatist movements. East Timor, of course, would um, separate in 99, would have its vote for independence. These other groups still want independence. So Indonesia has to have, um, maintain its territorial integrity, try and prevent secession. You've got massive movement of refugees in the region. Many of them making their way down to Australia or wanting to. So Indonesia, in its national interest, has to have a refugee policy. You've got radical Islam, anti-democratic groups. Indonesia has to do something in its national interest to be a good member of the international community. And finally, terrorist groups. So it's in Indonesia's national interest to have an anti-terrorist strategy, anti-terrorism strategy. So each of these are a national interest priority. And you can see how all of them came out of the period up until 1998. And they've achieved these to a different extent. And this is why this background PowerPoint I thought was important to see where these problems have come from, or at least some of them. And so we're left with this. And I, I swear I didn't arrange the letters like this. It was just chance that if you take Indonesia and write it down your page, it actually spells out. So you've got Indo, so the N is national interest. E, E, X, R, I, A. So in terms of writing an any essay, once you write that down and you drop each of these in, you can see how your paragraphs can stick together very easily. And your essay for this unit, and hopefully for the exam, because I hope everyone writes on either Indonesia or refugees, it's so beautiful, the essay question, you can only possibly get asked four questions. Because remember, students in global politics are studying one of five states, so they can't ask a question specific to one state. It has to be broad. 
And the only common things between the five states are national interests, types of power, forms of power, and FPI, foreign policy. So you know your question is going to be one of those four things. It's the most predictable part of the exam, and you're SAC. There's only four types of question. It's either about types of power, you know. What types of power does Indonesia use to achieve its national interests? Or, how successfully has Indonesia used foreign policy instruments? Um, does the state you have studied use hard or soft forms of power to achieve its objectives? They're really predictable essay questions. And at least with this little, is it an acronym or a mnemonic device? Which one is it? Mnemonic device, let's call it that. Each of the national interest priorities are there. Okay.